Okay, just so continue. Go. So I have to do that and download because I like, um because I've also read it's on you name. Hello, good afternoon or morning or evening, depending on where in the world you're joining us from. Awesome. Thank you for being here. I'm very excited to be in conversation with these awesome minds today. Um, just so you all know, there is a Q&A feature in Zoom that we would like to utilize. So uh, depending on how you're having this loaded, it may be at the top of your screen to the right or at the bottom of the screen toward the center. Toward the end of our conversation, we will be taking um, Q&As from you all. So feel free to start loading those up. Um, so today we have with us Bisa Butler, Adama Delphine Fawundu, Dr. Fahamu Piku, I enjoy saying doctor, thank you so much. <laughs> and Alexi Peskin joining us from Paris. So um, I wanted to begin, first of all, this conversation is being hosted by Adama. So that is going to be the brand new African Diaspora Muse Art Museum of Atlanta. Um, they will soon launch. And Dr. Piku and a host of other incredible um, citizens and, you know, African thinkers in Atlanta are joining together to make that happen. So this is one of the first of many of a series of conversations that will sort of open the dialogue around what that museum is meant to be doing. Um, one of the things that they have in their mission is everywhere you are, there you, is it, what is, I'm sorry, Fahamu, I'm messing this up. What is it? <laughs> everywhere we go, there we are. Yes, brilliant. So, with that in mind, this conversation is really meant to foreground that. So we have um, people like me who, you know, born in Brooklyn, but my family's from the Caribbean. Bisa, whose family is African-American from the South, correct, Bisa? Um, father's from Ghana, mother's from Louisiana. Okay, so, so <laughs> complicated. So we have West African <laughs> roots. We have Alexi, who's uh, raised in France, but has roots in Brazil and other places in diaspora. Fahamu, whose family is also Afro-Caribbean. Um, Delphine, whose family is like actually quite complicated and interesting. So um, her mom was born in Equatorial Guinea. Her father was born in Sierra Leone. So we are having a wide diasporic discussion. And also just about this idea of what is diaspora because like we were having a brief chat yesterday and one of the things that came up is that for us who live in certain cities, metropolitan areas, this idea of diaspora is not abstract for us, but for a great many of us, it is very abstract. So we are going to dive into all of that today, as well as um, some notions about the traditions of, of art history that each of these artists are drawing from. And so I wanna start officially uh, by reading this quote from Tokwase Dyson. I think blackness will swallow the whole of terror to be free. It will move across distances, molecules, units, through architecture, atmospheres, and concrete, in magic and bloodstreams to self-liberate. To image and imagine movements and geographies of freedom, known and unknown, it is to regard this space as irreducible, to regard black spatial movement as irreducible. So I thought that would be a good sort of place for us to begin in terms of framing our thinking and our discussion. Um, so you guys, let's chat. <laughs> I, I really love uh, the, the idea in that quote uh, of just the undeniability of Blackness, of Black ideals, of Black uh, movement, of Black articulation, um, which again really kind of goes back to, you know, the tagline for Adama, you know, everywhere we go, there we are, you know, despite um, many, many efforts uh, to, to sort of silence um, or deny the, uh, the power, the majesty, the, the grace, um, that we all are, are quite familiar with in, in, in our daily um, expressions, uh, that despite those efforts to, to kind of squash that, Blackness thrives, right? It, 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 it's undeniable. It's a voice that cannot be 
silence and it will always find ways to ex assert itself. Um, and so I'm, 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 I'm really honored to be a, a part of a community and a part of a tradition of representing that. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. Something that I think about is the, um, the movement, you know, and regardless of where you go in the world, how you see this presence and this movement of, you know, people who descended from Africa. And so I am also interested in the other way of seeing the world outside of this westernized way that has been implanted in the way that we understand history, the way that we are looking at self. And so when I think about this idea of, you know, diaspora, I think about how do we see the world in another way? Like there are various other ways to exist and to live on this earth. And I'm really interested in digging deep and finding different ways to see myself, to see others, to see my existence and my relation to this space. <laughs> me, I mean, like, for me, I think it's like so important to, um, um, I think like, you know, like, because there's been, it's been, a, um, uh, we've been cut. I mean, like, you know, if you come from uh, uh, the America, I mean, the Americas, uh, or if your family comes from. Uh-oh. Of, uh, so much I think to me like what's important is like the the misunderstanding that's uh between us like you know um when we talk about like what's really important for me is to is uh pan-africanism mm -hmm. um but like and I think that um social media like really helps uh uh, uh tie that back because uh uh I think there's so much that we don't know um for instance like there's so much that <clears throat> Uh, black Americans won't know about like black French or about like you know people in Africa but there's so much that people in Africa like in different countries whether it's Senegal Nigeria like South Africa uh, don't know much about um, um, America and black America or like South America you know um, Afro Brazil and to me um, there's definitely a challenge in that and, and, and one thing that I've seen like recently uh, is you know everybody understand a little bit more uh, of everyone else around um, because of social media uh, 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 because we're more exposed to a lot of things that we do and, and problems and we're seeing that actually um, a lot of our problems are, are parallel and uh, uh, yeah that's, and and so for me I don't know if like I'm taking no, no, no. Some, uh, keep going. Yeah. Um, but like one thing that I'm, that I'm doing for myself about that, like, I mean, like, uh, uh is, um, I'm trying to, because we've been cut from our histories, uh, in Africa, like, I'm not like trying to necessarily like, find like, you know, like my roots and be like, oh, my people and all that. Cause I know that we've been, there's something that's been cut that we, we won't, we won't get anymore, but like, I'm trying to understand. That's why I'm trying to, uh, one of my goals before I'm 50 is also like to, see all 54 countries on the continent hmm. uh, and trying to seek knowledge uh you know and, and see things see the histories that's been like uh uh taken away from us or like hidden from us and everything i think it's like so important you know? yeah yeah i definitely agree with that visa mm -hmm. um i was just thinking about that concept you know of blackness um I think about it in technical terms. We all know as artists, like if you spill that India ink, it's just like, it's over, you know? Mm -hmm. Or if you add too much black into your paint, it, whatever color that is, it's gonna turn black. And, and how overpowering it is. But then I think back like what Alexi was talking about with Africa in, in prior to slavery, how that concept of blackness didn't even exist. Mm -hmm. and how we were all these you know, separate nations like Dahomey and um, Songhai like they didn't consider themselves all one not in that way so it's unifying in a way but then it's interesting how it didn't even exist prior to a certain era 
Yeah, I think that adds to the complexity of blackness. Like when we say blackness, what does that really mean? And so what you said is something that I think about all the time. So if we focus too much, like it's like you have to unify in order to fight oppression, but your whole life can't be dedicated to fighting oppression because you have to live and understand this diversity at the same time. So mm -hmm. there co the complexity begins. So mm -hmm. it's just interesting. Um, I think being aware of that now gives you more insight to continue to research and learn and understand mm -hmm. these different positions, you know? Yeah, and I think too, um, a point that Alexi was, was uh, making as well, uh, you know, the, the, the advent of, of social media um, has created a space where we can literally connect across the diaspora to have these kinds of discussions, to get these kinds of uh, uh, experiences or have this kind of exposure to one another in ways that we've never been able to do before, which, you know, not only tears down walls, but it actually reminds us that we are much more than what we thought we, what we thought we were. Right. Yeah. And also right. like, oh, sorry. This no, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, I think like, yeah, there's, there's that. And now, uh, I mean, to be honest, uh, we're also like, you know, as a diaspora, people in the world, uh, we're also interested in going to the continent. Like it's becoming like more glamorous and everything. Like, I mean, to be honest, if we go back, like, you know, uh, uh, that wasn't the image that was portrayed of, of, uh, of the continent before. Uh, and now people are like, you know, traveling way more, I would say, uh, to the continent and young people and stuff. And, you see, and we've seen <clears throat> like in the past, like, years like uh things uh, uh like uh, travel noir and stuff like that you know and uh so so you see that there's definitely like an interest uh not just of people who are scholars or artists or whatever but like you know uh, a general interest and, and uh man like i mean yeah all across like it's definitely more more glamorous. i was seeing like, i think like it was like two two days ago i saw this video of like uh um scandinavian like people dancing like dombolo or something uh, mm -hmm. uh, taking them with the Buller class, which was like really interesting. Like <laughs> when uh, when I was coming up, yeah. it definitely wasn't the trend. You know what I'm saying like it wasn't. Yeah. Cool. yeah, it's it's interesting too because then the slippery slope is like how do we um, not fall into the capitalistic trap or the you know the commercialized trap of all of this, right? Because um, people were doing these movements physically as from, you know, and think about like the movements across the, from New York, from America to Africa in terms of like these various movements. You think about like Marcus Garvey and his call for this movement, you know what I mean? Right, of right. Freedom, like real freedom that we haven't reached yet when it comes to even now, because even with, with these ideas of, um, of social media like what are we building together to is something like these things have been the blueprint has been set over generations upon generations upon generations like i think about the first the first chapter of michael gomez's exchanging our country marks and they talk about you know um they're on the plantation in in, the, in america talking about being inspired <laughs> by the Haitian revolution, like that's deep, you know what I mean? And this is before all of this, you know what I mean? So I challenge us to think in that way, like we have a lot of work to do when it comes to real issues affecting us on the continent and the, around the world. And I'm thinking about, I'm challenging myself too. This is why I go all the time. What can I do to make like some real contribution to thought, to change, to the way that we're living with each other that goes beyond you know let's go all and watch this movie you right. know okay y'all so i have some kind of framing thoughts or questions that i want us to kind of shift over to um so thinking about all of that we've all that we've just said thinking about these historical and global tensions and connections what are the ways that you are mining that within your work specifically mm -hmm. can you say that again Sure. So considering all of what we just discussed regarding historical and global connections and tensions that we are all thinking about and that sort of fuel our work, what are the specific ways that that's tangible in your work? I mean, I think about it. Oh, is it all right if I? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm thinking about 
historic mining historical connections in my work. Um, this morning I was just doing, you know, just a little research online because there's always that push and pull between, you know, is our expression originally African American or is it uh, European influenced art made by Black people or is it this African aesthetic, like which, which one is it? And it's just very interesting that I find within my own work, the quilts, there's no one thing, but I have been thinking specifically about my own ancestry, my father's ancestry in Ghana and the Kente strips. Like we all see those strips of Kente and we see um, the colors that are used. So some of my quilts, lately i've been stitching the actual so i'm making portraits but i guess i guess we can share imagery right yes you yes. can yeah yeah uh, I, I guess i had to figure out how to do that but <laughs> so if but, you <laughs> open uh the images within your whatever you're using whatever device you're using you can yeah. also share the screen in the center okay let me see I'll say that again. There's a, at the bottom of your screen, there's a little green button that says share. Yeah. 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 You have a window oh. and with images or anything like that. You can click oh. that and share your Ooh. screen. So instead of the video view, people will see your screen. Ooh. Okay. But you don't want to share the screen until you've um, like found what you want on the screen so they don't see all your business. <laughs> okay. You could go to exit full screen and then you'll have access to the other um, things. Okay. Done. All right, can can you all see this? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, do you see the pattern in the background? Yeah. These stitches. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was talking about, the quilting itself. I was looking at Kente strips and I was thinking, how can I like directly tie it in? Not just I usually just let it come through me indirectly. I'm not like saying like, oh, I want to make this look specifically like anything else but I wanted deliberately to have this image that I had quilted of Frederick Douglass have these strips of like Kente-like patterns within my quilting so that I'm reinforcing this idea of like his connection to Africa, my own connection to Africa. Um, Frederick Douglass being this strong African-American man and Kente itself that traditionally was made by men. So I wanted to deliberately um, highlight that. That's amazing. Um, Delphine, I feel like it's a natural progression. Okay. Um, <laughs> pardon? Me, I said, okay, let me um, share the screen here. Um, here. Okay. So um, this series I call Passageways, and it's a, a series that I started thinking about is, uh, when I was thinking about connecting to my immediate family in Sierra Leone. So my grandmother was, her profession was actually batik printing on fabric. Mm -hmm. And my connection to her has always been being in Brooklyn. Can you hear me? Can you explain what that is? Oh, okay. So when you're hand dyeing fabric with the if you look at the borders, all of the fabric in this material in this picture are made by hand. And so, um, you know, you're tie dyeing, you're stamping, you're doing all of these things with 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 um, inks, natural inks, and cotton. So um, even the dress that I'm wearing was a dress that my grandmother hand dyed, gave to my mother. And then now I'm wearing it. So it's actually looking at these materials that have been sent to me from across this huge ocean. And the thing, the one thing that always connected me to my family. And um, she passed the tradition down to my aunt, who continued the um, tradition and would always send us. So my connection, I use this as a starting point with this series and a lot of the new works that I've been making, I've been going back to these fabrics because I think about the patterns, I think about the, um, the water, I think about all of the symbols that they represent and how that represents this huge idea of diaspora and people. And so it's something that I always go back to. I think about um, also something I've been in, so influenced by is um, Mende culture. 
I'm Mende from um, Sierra Leone and Krim, you know, on my father's side, Mende on my grandmother's side. And I think about how we saw ourselves in that time, in the time, or traditionally, how we traditionally saw ourselves, how we saw God, how we saw creation. And I'm thinking about all of those things as I'm making work. So here I'm thinking about the ideas of what is shared, what is transferred, what is not transferred. You know, when we think about um, tradition of passing information along, oral traditions, traditions that we pass along without even physical contact, you know, tradition that lives in our, or in, information that is transferred through DNA. Like I think about all of those things in this series here. And so it was just important for me to, um, oh, I'm missing. Tell us who these people are also. Oh yeah, so this is my godmother who is actually, um, you know, living like right next door to me. And so, you know, here we are, and that's me. I, I'm, I'm usually, I use myself in most of my work. Um, here is my cousin, and there's one that's missing, goodness, that I don't have. <laughs> and I'll take you through my whole desktop. But you get the, the, um, the, the gist, I guess, right? of um, the fabrics and even when I travel now back and forth I'm always collecting these fabrics as a symbol and looking at different ways to use them in the work but beyond their um, the material use but more for the symbolic use and um, even what was more what was really interesting to me was to find <clears throat> out that my grandmother after going to Sierra Leone two years ago well that was three years ago talking to someone who lived in the house with her and she told me that my grandmother used this um, form of making materials in order to send all of her children to school, which is interesting too. You know, there's another layer to it, right? And so even beyond the tradition of doing these things, now you think about the value of now, of a, of a sense of independence, where she was like, I'm not going to depend on my grandfather, but I'm going to do this for my kids, you know? So that's just one example. Um, but with all of the work, I'm always in contact with the Orishas. I'm in contact with, you know, Yemaya, with Mami Water. I'm always in contact with all of those, with deities while making work. And um, I kind of think of my art practice as a rites of passage, so to speak. Um, I've never formally been through a rites mm -hmm. of passage, but this new, I feel like over the last four years, I've been in, con in conversation with different deities as I'm making work and um, having more of a profound respect for my this environment that we live in and the earth and the water and nature and all of that stuff as i'm thinking through how to solve some of these problems in my mind yeah, yeah i want to um jump in there uh if i can uh to share exactly a, what i wanted you to do as it <laughs> <out>. <laughs> to, to share a little you know a little kind of backstory right so back in uh, maybe uh 2001 2002 i was making lots of drawings and paintings of these figures, these faces that uh, would just come to my, my, my mind. You know, people would often say, well, who's that? You know, what, what, is, what does this, you know, symbol mean that you put here? What is this feather about that you have over here? And I couldn't really articulate why I was doing what I was doing. Um, but, uh, you know, again, like I said, around uh, 2001, a friend of mine came to visit me that I hadn't seen in a long time. He's dressed in all whites. I'm like, why are you dressed like that? He was like, well, I just came back from Nigeria. I just became initiated as a Babalawo. And I'm like, a what? You know? And he's like, you know, it's a priest and Ifa. And I had never heard of this before. Uh, anyway, I ended up going to an Ile here in Atlanta. And it happened to be the first Sunday of the month. And I'm it was sorry, the what yeah. is an Ile? Oh, remember, not everyone knows what it's Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, an Ile is uh, a, uh, an Ifa temple. Um, and so I, I go on this particular day, um, it's the day that they are uh, venerating the ancestors and they have this whole, you know, uh, ceremony and they're talking about uh, why it's essential to venerate the ancestors, what it looks like, and they're describing the symbolisms and the ideas and the, the philosophies behind it. And as they're talking, I'm realizing everything that they're saying is the stuff that I'm thinking and feeling and trying to do in my work. And all of a sudden, Ifa gives me this language to describe my ideas and my relationship to my art practice, but also the way that I see the world. Uh, and so it just re really became really interesting for me to, um, to, to be able to engage with, with that particular, um, uh, can you see my screen here? Yeah. Sorry. Yep, it's loading. Okay. Uh, so it became really interesting for me to be able to 
connect to that um, that that part of 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 myself and that part of my history. Uh, I'm not sure why this thing is taking so long. Okay, let me stop because it's not working. I'll I'll come back and show some images, but um, the you know the idea that uh, you know, in my DNA is this memory and this history, um, you know, even beyond my own ability to articulate it was extremely powerful for me. Um, and it continues to be a major part of my uh, practice. Um, you know, this idea of identifying and um, articulating these African cultural retentions um, that, that, that manifest in the ways that we every day um, are, are moving in the world, you know what I mean? Like, you know, to, yeah. to learn that the, the, the rhythm of um, uh, certain drum patterns that we are familiar with in, you know, hip hop and salsa and, you know, all these different, you know, music forms actually originate as, as uh, spiritual music, you know? Uh, right. that, that kind of thing is, is really like fascinating to me. And I'm, I'm, I'm always, you know, kind of digging into you know, these, I'm sorry, these different, um, uh, as, as I said, uh, cultural retentions. Um, so in particular, I wanted to just kind of share some images from a series that I did uh, called Do or Die, um, Affect, Ritual, and Resistance. And these works are all in conversation with the Egungu, um, which mm -hmm. are the ancestors. And so for me, this idea that our ancestors are constantly working through us um, and talking to us, uh, and that our connection with with these spirits, with these ancestral spirits, is symbiotic. Right? Um, we exist because of them, but they also continue to exist because of us. Mm -hmm. Right? And 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 that for me is a really powerful, transformative way of seeing myself and my my race and my blackness and my culture uh, in the world. Beautiful. Let's go. Alexi. Yeah, yeah. Well, man, like, yo, this is like, um, I'm, I'm in a, first of all, like, I'm, this is really cool to be around y'all, man, like, you know, around <laughs> our friends. And, stuff. Uh -huh. right, and we came all, all, all this way, you know what I'm saying? And y'all, mm -hmm. anyway, but like, yeah, um, yeah, man, like, what's, I mean, back to the, the diaspora thing, uh, this like the experiences like you know everywhere i go and the experiences that i see like i'm interested in seeing the different black experiences and these experiences uh, including my own uh inform uh what my what my work is about right um because my work is about the black experience uh on a global level <clears throat> and so as you were saying earlier you know grew up in france mother from brazil from bahia where like actually you I actually yeah I joined uh both of you uh, um uh all of you actually on that conversation about the Orishas mm -hmm. and uh Yoruba tradition because my mother was raised in that uh um uh, and um so before like she became atheist but then you know those are like images and, and culture that I that that I saw really early on. And then uh you know going to Howard in the US and seeing and like there's so much that I learned from like, you know, uh, not just me, that the world, the black, that um, black people all around the world, like uh, learns and uh, uses from, you know, black America um, in, far, in, in, in terms of uh, uh, organizing and even like, you know, like uh, uh, resistance uh, uh, jargon. Uh, like in France, for instance, most of our words uh, uh, come from, uh, I'm from uh, America and Black America, you know, like uh, when, when we're talking about resisting, you know, and fighting racism and all this. So anyway, my, my work uh, was influenced by this early experience of like, you know, um, of racism, police brutality in France, where I grew up, uh, in Brazil, where like I saw, you know, all these injustices and, and, and uh, and uh, knew of this history, um, and then the U.S. and back to now 
understanding, trying to understand Africa, the continent, like where uh, uh, we have our roots, you know, and uh, the histories of Africa, like pre-colonial, pre-slavery and everything, you know. Uh, so little by little, um, when I started, like I had like one of my first like major shows at Mokata in, uh, in Brooklyn, uh, shout outs to Mokata. <laughs> uh, and um, so um, uh, when I, the, the first thing that I, I was doing when I was in the States was actually creating a bridge. That's what I was talking about earlier, creating a bridge between um, Afro-French people, Afropeans and uh, Black America, because like there was like a lot of like parallel things that, that and, and uh, uh, conversations that we have. And I feel, I feel like in the U.S., like people were like much more advanced, you know, in some of these conversations, I think. And it was interesting. But then at the same time, back then, like people in the U.S. didn't know much. Uh, a lot of people didn't know there were black people in France. Uh, when I said I was from France, people, where we have like the, the highest population of one of the highest population of black people in Europe. People didn't know that. So like my work was kind of like bridging uh, uh, black America and France. And then after a certain point, I was talking about my frustrations, like, you know, trying to claim Frenchness because we were never like considered French as black people in France or whatever, and talk about colonialism. And then at some point, my work got kind of like y'all's work a little bit more, I would say, spiritual uh, 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 and about energy or whatever, uh, less intellectual. In the beginning, sometimes I, uh, I would use like humor to talk about like, you know, uh, issues that are deeper and that hurt. But then to a point I was like, yo, what we live in, all this, especially like in the past 10 years because of, I mean, stuff that we've experienced, but because seeing them, seeing police brutality, like so vividly, like through, and, and, and like every day on our cell phones, like, you know, like it ain't funny. So like I don't have to just like explain my work by going through humor, like to to calm everybody down. So then my work got more solemn uh, and uh, and spiritual or whatever. And uh, I don't know, it became a little bit more minimalist and was more about an energy. Fahang, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, I, I don't, um, do you have like a couple images, maybe? I'm trying to pull them up now. Pull them up. Okay, cool. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, I kind of like use all these experiences and see kind of like the um, the the um, the similarities uh, that we have, uh, and uh, I don't know. And my work, my work is I would say it's like very uh, in this essence is very like black. It's very pro-black, man. Like I me, mean, if I if I want to keep it real, it's very pro-black, you know. And um, and I don't know, like. It's more about the pain that we suffer that I'm kind of like trying to make myself, uh, I'm trying to show uh, uh, our power. Like this, actually, this image is called power. It's like a, a, a father and his daughter. Um, uh, and I kind of try to go against, you know, the stereotypes uh, that will link to um, uh, uh, blackness, you know, in a very, uh, Eurocentric and white supremacist world, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, th those those images are like the kind of like the latest work that 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 was making, which uh, are called power figures. You know, why you question for you about that? Okay, go ahead. So regarding calling them power figures, where where does that come from? Like I know, but you yeah, know, maybe other people don't. So I want you to kind of tease yeah. that. Power figures actually comes from uh, the Nkisin Kondi uh, power figures of the Congo, uh, which are, um, uh, you know, like little sculptures uh, with nails in them uh, to protect whoever um, um, uh, owns uh, these, these, uh, these power figures. And so uh, in my work, uh, I don't know if you can tell from the images, but I'm using uh, nails. So all the little dots that you see, are, are nails on wood. Uh, in the background, I stained the wood with coffee um, to talk about the idea of exploitation, uh, human exploitation, exploitation of, of uh, uh, um, Afro descendants, uh, whether like in, in the Americas and everywhere actually. 
and uh, uh, and then I use also gold gold leaf on top of the nails. So the nails is a is a metaphor for those power figures because there are nails um, who are well, that that are um, uh, um, uh, put there for protection. So um, and I have like I think like in in the diaspora we have many uh, uh, figure protect. Um, figures of protection. Like we have uh, in Brazil, the figa, um, uh, which is definitely coming from like Afro-Brazilian tradition. We also have the uh, uh, carrancas. Uh, in the Congo, you have the power figures, the, the Nkisim Kondi. And um, so those are, uh, are things from different uh, cultures uh, 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 where like, you know, Afro-descendants are, African are, uh, that I wanted to, to include in my work. Because I think that protection uh, so, so, you know, like using nails is kind of like, there's an, this idea of pain uh, uh, and, and being hurt, which comes to like, you know, if you want to talk about our part of our past, which is slavery and everything, and, and this part of our experience, uh, uh, I, I use the nails, but also I think with nails, you, you use nails to build things up. Uh, so this, the, this idea of construction, um, uh, deconstruction and reconstruction or whatever. Uh, and going back uh, on the idea that a nail is something that's very overlooked uh, and uh, um, but I'm making it central in my work so like uh, being overlooked is the idea that basically we built like the strongest uh, 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 cultures and economies in the world uh, um, and that we don't benefit from it and that also but that also our lives are not valued so that's the idea of a nail, which basically holds everything together, but you don't see it. Um, so that's the metaphor for like power figures and, and the nail, or whatever. Yeah. All right, blow blow our minds, why don't you, Alexi? <laughs> 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 Look who's talking. <laughs> right. That said, friends, um, I want us to kind of think about the sort of formal elements of your practices. Um, so, for example, Bisa, are you you're using photos as references in some cases, archival photos? Yes. Uh, Delphine, you're kind of doing that, but you're also making documents also. You're also having some video elements. Uh, Fahamu, you're also working from photographs. And of course, the paint. Alexi, you're also working from photographs, also doing some videos. So I'm just wondering about your entry points into sort of developing your visual languages. Whoever wants to go first can. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I'll, I'll go. I mean, I think, um, you know, my, my, my practice uh, really started out as a critique of uh, media and popular culture. Um, so I was really looking at like, magazines and you know music videos and all these kinds of things that you know were really becoming the sort of uh, um, author of what the black male experience was right in, in American popular culture. Um, uh, do you have some images for us to show us? Yeah for sure um, and uh, you know I was really uh, you know sort of making a mockery actually of of that uh, of, of that form. Uh, and so I began doing these like photo shoots as this like hip hop, you know, celebrity, you know, uh, and ultimately I really began to shift the, um, the ideas of my, my work to be more, uh, more strategic um, in the way that I was critiquing, um, critiquing this medium. Uh, and really thinking about it as a way of, uh, as, a, as a form of performance, right? So there's all of these ideas about Black masculinity that we are sold, um, but I wanted to unpack them. I wanted to sort of like, you know, uh, undo them from the inside out. And so uh, I'm trying to <laughs> find some of the photos, sorry, uh, um, to really uh, begin to play around with it. Excuse me one second while I... Hold these up. Um, but yeah, so that's really kind of where the photos and everything came from. But it ultimately began to extend into other uh, mediums, such as uh, 
video and film, uh, you know, and, 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 and again, performance art. So I really see the, my practice as a very performance based practice. Um, you know, the, the photos are one phase and then, you know, ultimately the work, uh, the, the painting is the last stage of that uh, performance. Um, so here are uh, some images uh, of like some new photos that I recently did, if it will open. Ugh. Okay, sharing now. Okay, are you seeing this? Yes. yes. Wow, so this is one of those uh, photos here. And, and, and again, these are all very much staged uh, um, photo shoots. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about the lighting, I'm thinking about the costuming, I'm thinking about all of these different elements. I'm really art directing as well as performing. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know why my computer is plugging out all of a sudden. Y'all getting to see all my business now. <laughs> okay, here we go. So, uh, you know, every every aspect of uh you know like my concept is is I'm, I'm attempting to articulate through the the posturing the again the costuming uh colors um and this is you know really for many people uh they never see this side of the work they only see the paintings um mm -hmm. but the photographs become very much a big part of that narrative this is how i'm thinking through this is a part of like my thought process mm -hmm. uh, in, in crafting the work. Um, so can we talk specifically about some of the iconography in this particular image that we're on right now? Yeah, for sure. So this is a series that I'm working on. It's called um, Trapodemia 2, and the subtitle is Lit. Um, and so I'm exploring uh, classic Black literature as a way to talk about how we judge um, Black male youth, um, uh, in 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 a in a sense, I'm uh, playing around with this idea of like don't judge a book by its cover, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm juxtaposing what I'm calling these kind of trap bodies with classic black literature, um, mm -hmm. and in this particular piece, you know, uh, I, I think it's kind of obvious the idea is about balance, um, you know. So you have the the, the book, uh, which ultimately in the painting becomes um, things fall apart by Chinua Achebe. Um, and the, the piece on the back end uh, here is a Sankofa. Mm -hmm. um, uh, mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, there's this idea of like balancing. And so I'm, you know, just really sort of like playing with like the costuming in terms of the costume and thinking about black male youth culture, hip hop, you know, but I'm also thinking about uh, traditional um, elements that, that might call up African ideology or African aesthetics, um, you know, with the, the sculpture and maybe even with the twine and the, the, the stick, you know, things like that. So, but so, also yeah. with the, the cancer, yeah, the sure. yeah. So yeah, you know, this kind of, you know, as you can kind of see, like these uh, uh, images, they go through a, a few different iterations, you know, uh, in the crafting um, mm -hmm. of them, you know, the mm -hmm. virtual reality visors that are uh, adorned with the cowrie shells talk about, you know, um, black imagination, um, you know, yeah. So, yeah, that's kind of me. That's great. Yeah. Great, great. Can you talk about that incredible wardrobe you got too? <laughs> 
<laughs> um, so Alexi, for you, I would like for you to talk about using photography as a starting point for uh, your power figure works. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so um, in my work, it's true, like my work's very f photography uh, because I do start with photo um, uh, before actually going on and translating the image into Photoshop. Actually, I can, uh, I'm working on two pieces right now, so I, I could try to share the screen. Uh, yeah, like this right here, for instance. Uh, share. So like, um, I'm working on this image uh, uh, of this actually incredible like Ndebele artist uh, uh, I shot in um, South Africa. And uh, uh, from um, uh, the photograph, and I'm working on it on Photoshop, uh, you know, balancing the, the, the darks and lights to make sure that the image looks like uh, really striking uh, before I translate it into dots. Uh, and that there's like uh, I kind of like uh, essentialize the 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 dots to like eight different sizes of nails, and so each dot is going to be a nail. Um, so right now, so this is how I start. I actually take the photo, and then uh, um, it's pretty interesting, like uh, uh, because like it goes from uh, doing things like that's like very like modern, like you know, using like the computer and like Photoshop and. Uh, mm -hmm and uh, photograph then to like doing things like go leafing, baby. Yes. Yeah. Like, okay. So uh, then um, using nails and like gold leaf, which is like much more, like much older, or even like staining wood, like, you know, with coffee, with mud. Um, but yeah, like uh, um, to me, photography has always like uh, um, been very, uh, very important. And uh, I'm very drawn to uh to the human figure mm -hmm. uh um in general and, and also i think if we want to uh, take mm -hmm. it back to uh blackness um also what's really important for all of us uh, uh as artists and black artists to do uh and uh, um is to actually uh create images of ourselves uh from how we see us you know what i'm saying because uh, I think like the, the really, really like the problem uh, is that, um, and, and you can tell when, when a black person is not shot by a black person, or, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. or, and you can tell when a woman is shot by a man, like um, that's what, I, like I think like the problem more than the fact that we're objectified by the fact that we're shot more by other people than us, Mm -hmm. is the fact that the system doesn't show uh, us showing us, you know what I'm saying? Uh, if that makes any sense. Yeah. But I think like it's really important to have, and I'm like really happy that you pointed out that we all photographers and we all uh, define uh, you, like how our bodies, uh, we're using our own bodies and, and uh, uh, to, define, uh, to define ourselves. You know, rather than being objectified by other people. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> I could jump in. Okay, Alexa, you can end the share on your screen. Uh, oh, end the share. Okay, cool. Oh, wait, sorry. <laughs> Stop sharing. Oh, there you go. Sorry about that. Yeah, I wanted to jump in also the fact that we all are relying on photography, or I shouldn't say all of us, but many of us in this, in this group. But unlike you all, I don't take my own photos. I'm using photos that are really vintage. Um, I started out looking at photos from like the 1940s, and most of them were not taken by African-American people or by African people at all. And then I started looking at photos of my recent work back to the, um, I'm just gonna, let's go to pictures, back to some of them all the way back to the 1880s and sort of all the way to the edge of when photography 
first started being used as a medium from the Daruga types and such like, uh, let's see, you can see this photo here mm -hmm. of Frederick Douglass himself as a young man. And it's the, the, what compelled me was what were we like at that time? You know, we don't really think of, well, we do think of our people past or before slavery ended, but the imagery then in that time is gonna be limited because photography wasn't that prevalent. So somebody like Frederick Douglass would compel me and make me think about who took the photo, why was the photo taken, and what is he trying to say? So he himself knew the power of photography and mm -hmm. the way he's looking at us, you know, that gaze mm -hmm. that itself was a challenge. I mean, at this time, black people weren't even supposed to look white Americans or anybody white in the eye. Mm -hmm. If you do, you should be like depreciatory or you should smile or shuffle or something like that. Mm -hmm. So he's gazing. And then I read also that he refused to smile in his photos. And I think one photographer published an image of him smiling and he went and like tore it up like he was angry because <laughs> he was like that is not what i am trying to say about mm -hmm. myself and then i started getting interested in sort of subverting that idea as well photos that were taken of us as documentary images like oh you know this african-american person let's say is is so forlorn and or, oh, I don't know if that one worked. All right, well, this person is considered forlorn. Let's change that. And I'm saying like, I wanna say from the inside out what we think of it. Um, what, when I look at a person, maybe I don't see forlornness. Maybe I don't see um, somebody who is something to be pitied or to be, to be just to be looked at like uh, less than. I'm looking at my people as something that should be admired. So some of these photos are taken like this is just from Pinterest, right? This was a chief in a province of is this Mama or oh, Guinea, in Guinea, but this was taken like a postcard, you know oh, look, he's an interesting fellow, I guess, an African subject. But when we look at it, we see something else entirely different. Yes, we see a beautiful subject, but I also see like he could be one of us, related to one of us. His blood could be flowing in our veins right now. So I'm looking at it like a family member. And so I feel like it's, it's important to kind of grab back those images. Um, not a postcard, I'm not something that you need to pity, but I am something that should be honored. So I wanna grab it back from the past and then recharacterize it and then put it forward. Uh, here's one, okay, something for us to admire, for us to feel that this photo was taken of a young man standing in Paris in eight, uh, 1919. I might have the dates wrong. He was on his way to World War I, so is that 1914? Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Bisa, can you, can you, uh, you know, talk a little bit about your material here? Because oh, I, sure. I think it's, you know, it may not be clear to everyone what they're looking at. Right. Stunning. Let me zoom in. So his face is made from little bits of silk and cotton, wool and velvet. And there are all these bits are cut and then stitched together. And his clothing primarily is made of African cloth, also with silk layered on top and velvet. And each um, bit of African cloth, for instance, on his arm, this print that kind of looks like a brain, mm. um, that's a particular African print called Kofi Annan's brain. Mm. And it, it was named that by the women in the African the marketplace in Togo and 
uh, Nigerian Ghana. I also used it on his pants. But so I like the pattern. I like the name Kofi Annan's brain, but I want to like reinforce what I'm trying to say. A Senegalese soldier going to fight for the French as a colonialized person, an oppressed person, he's on his way to war. And these soldiers were used in the front lines. So when this photo was taken, he may not have ever made it back. Mm -hmm. And even if he did, he's risking his life and limb for a nation that is, is, is keeping him oppressed. And so I wanted to put that Kofi Annan, that pattern on there to talk about, this is a man who was a Secretary General of the United Nations, who is, was looking for the respect and the protection of people like this young man. Um, and all of the patterns mean, have significant meanings. Um, the, this pattern lower on his pants, the blue with the zigzag, that particular pattern is called Nkrumah's pencil. So that was named after Kwame Nkrumah, just to talk about his speeches and his eloquence and being the first president of a um, freed African nation. I, um, excluding Ethiopia though, I mean a colonial, colonialized nation in 1950, I think it was 57 or 54, historians can check those dates. <laughs> but I just, I just wanted to just talk about that, photos that were not taken for, to show that we are admirable or beautiful or anything and then transforming it into something that is Mm -hmm. Wow, all the, all the claps. I, I love that you uh, mentioned Fred, Frederick Douglass because at his time he actually commissioned most of his photographs and right. was very intentional about what he wanted to um, come out into the world. And that makes me think about W.B. Du Bois too, commissioning someone. And he particularly used a white woman because he knew that he could market it easily. <laughs> Um, so he was like, I'm not going to use a white man, but I'll go in the middle and use a white woman, you know, who also was, didn't have certain rights during that time. But to yeah. know that they actually put all of these photographs in the 1900s and um, prior to, just to get this, this is what we look like in the world. And it's important for you across the world and across the country to know what we look like. So it just shows like the power of photography. Right. But also, if I may, um, Frederick Douglass was actually the most photographed person yeah. in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. yes. Like of any yes. human being yes. alive. Yeah, I have the, like, book. the book is amazing. It's all of his photographs and the stories behind them. It's so amazing. Yeah, I got, I have that book too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so really quick, <laughs> just a, a note for our audience. Um, mm -hmm. We did intend to devote a 10 to 15 minute period toward the end of our discussion to your questions. Obviously it's 1257. So maybe mm -hmm. we're not gonna be able to fully um, have that. We're hoping the conversation doesn't just end at one, um, mm -hmm. but we're sorry if it does. Mm -hmm. um, and real quick, I just also wanna note something just regard, with regard to photography and the development of the chemical processes that are necessary mm -hmm. uh, for the <clears throat> of photography. I think it's important to note that, of course, this is happening around 1834. Hi, this is happening around 1834. So this idea that, where does that money come from? It comes from us, it comes from our ancestors, the exploitation of their labor. And I think um, that that's critically important in terms of how we understand what we are doing within the medium now. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say that and mm -hmm. continue to, mm -hmm place that into our conversation. Delphine, take it away with whatever time we have left. <laughs> so I'm, I'm primarily photo based. Um, recently, I've been using video, which is extremely exciting. Um, I've been using video and sound. And because I'm so fixated with this idea of layering, and I guess I could share my screen and show you an example of um, the video. Okay, here we go. Um, here we go. Okay. So also, I, I'm sorry, I meant to ask you before uh -huh. with regard to the, the fabric <laughs> that you showed us or the fabric works that you showed us before. Yeah. That wasn't actually fabric though, right? Which ones? Uh, oh no, those ones. Oh well, yeah, the borders are not 
fab yeah the actual piece is in in print but when you look at it it looks like it's fabric because it's a thing that i like to play with in terms of identity and how you know we're so fixated on identity and what things look like and who they are but we have so many layers to us and we're more complex than that so i use my, my the um paper and i print fabric onto paper that looks like it makes you want to touch it's so tactile it makes you want to want to touch it but really when you touch it you see oh my god this is not fabric so i do that a lot um with my work in a way to again think about identity and the, the complexities of our identity um i'm not sure of this thing let me see how this can you hear yes, yes. can you see the thing central because uh, I, uh, I think maybe if you expand the screen it will okay let me see I'm trying to move this thing over. Wait, let me see. Why did this happen? Okay, here we go. Hold on. Let me undo this for one second so I could get to the screen again. So um, what I'm saying is that with video and sound, I like the idea of layering. And I get to do that so well with video and sound, actually layer things and have different ideas and conversation with each other. So mm -hmm. it's a perfect place to, um, it's a perfect, all right, hold on, hold on. <laughs> it's a perfect place, wait, okay. Can you see it? I want to see. <laughs> wait, all right. Can you see? Can you hear it? You hear it? Yes. You can't see it. No? No. I'm not sure what to do about that. Okay, that's Maybe just show it small then, like you had it before. Oh, can you see it now? Oh, we're not seeing it. We're not seeing it. Let me see. That's so strange. What do you see on the screen? You? You. Mary, you don't see it. You don't see it. Okay, I don't know. Let me see. Okay. What about so, now? Yeah, Let me see. Okay. Alright, so this is just a snippet of like thinking about the deities, thinking about water, and thinking about layering. I like to listen to sounds for a little bit. You say blue, blue, you follow me everywhere. Ein Gedicht gegen die deutsche Scheinheit. Ich werde trotzdem afrikanisch sein, auch wenn ihr mich gerne Deutsch haben wollt. Und werde trotzdem Deutsch sein, auch wenn auf meine Schwärze nichts passt. Grenzenlos und unverschämt. Ein Gedicht gegen die deutsche Scheinheit. Ich werde trotzdem afrikanisch sein, auch wenn ihr mich gerne Deutsch haben wollt. Und werde trotzdem Deutsch sein, auch wenn euch meine Schwärzen nicht passen. Ich werde trotzdem Deutsch sein, auch wenn ihr mich gerne Deutsch haben wollt. Und werde trotzdem Deutsch sein, auch wenn euch meine Schwärzen nicht passen. Ich werde trotzdem Deutsch sein, auch wenn ihr mich gerne Deutsch haben wollt. Und werde trotzdem Deutsch sein, auch wenn euch meine Schwärzen nicht passen. Ich werde trotzdem Deutsch sein, so that's just an example of a new project that I just finished for um, a museum in Braunschweig. The I'm going to mess up the name of it. But the show is based on um, the work, the philosophy of Anton Willem Amo, who was a philosopher in the 1700s um, in Germany, in Braunschweig, Germany. And so his thinking actually inspired all the philosophers that you learn about in art history, like Kant and all the other ones, but you don't hear about him. So when we talk about like mining histories and everything, I'm so excited to be in a show. I didn't know about him until this show, the opportunity came about and I started researching him more. But um, so I think about like how to now reveal stories, <coughs> not even just about him, but about his philosophy, which is how we think about how we are today so his whole philosophy was around the body and the mind and i think about all of those layers when we think about the relationship between the body the mind the spirit how we exist today now it leads me back to those you know orishas and all of that other stuff so um photo translating into video and sound gives me so much room to play with when i'm sampling um sounds of may i am who was a a, a poet based in germany who was in, in Berlin, who was influenced by Audrey, Lerb, or Audrey Lord with, during her time in Berlin. So May I Am was um, 
adopted by German parents. And then she realized that her, her she figured, she researched that her father was from Ghana. And um, from that, she started making all of these revolutionary poems and everything, but she literally committed suicide and died because of oppression, which is really scary and crazy. And so um, she died in the 90s. And um, so it was important for me to take her voice, take Audre Lorde's voice and put it all on the same track along with, um, you know, the beautiful voice of Ella calling for the Orishas, along with um, chanting from um, Dwa in Douala from Cameroon. So thinking about the geographies and thinking about Germany as a place that all of this history exists, you know what I mean? That brings us to, that we could think about from different points on the earth is, to me, is a magnificent field to create work out of. So um, yeah, so that's what it is. I think like the way that we look at his story, the story, I should say, <laughs> Is is so you it's so interesting. Like when you could actually dig deep and find and reveal. I like that you said mm -hmm. that uncover um Alexi, all of the things that exist. It's not gone, it's there. We just have mm -hmm. to find it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh that's yeah, it. I'm jump on. <laughs> oh. all right. Well, thank well, you. Wait, I can't hear you. Oh no wonder. Oh, what? <laughs> Were you done? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm done. I have my volume down though. Okay. Um, so I just want to try to go through as many of these questions as we can. So I'll start mm -hmm. with the sort of uh, more kind of <clears throat> questions that are specific to the museum. Um, so will the African Diaspora Art Museum of Atlanta be a virtual museum? That's questions from Rita Awan. Okay. Sorry if I mispronounce anyone's name. Yes. So for, um, thank you for the question. Uh, and for the time being, Adama will be uh, virtual. Uh, our programming will be virtual. Um, we will be doing events like this. Uh, this uh, 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 salon series will happen uh, every Sunday um, at noon, and every week we'll have a different group of people, you know, unpacking these questions <laughs> about the diaspora. Um, and uh, we will be working with. Um, uh, organizations and institutions uh, in Atlanta and really around the world um, collaborating and uh, curating events and experiences uh, and we are working as diligently as we can towards a physical space because we would love to welcome you all uh, into a physical space at, at some point in the very near future but for now we will be virtual. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, bear with me. Will Adama organize trips for us to go see this work in person? I don't know if technically that answered the question. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think that would be great for 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 us to 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 think about. I definitely will. Uh, you know, all of the the board are online right now watching this uh, event. Uh, so I want to definitely shout them out. You know, Heather, Sohei, uh, Val, Mike, Darwin. George, uh, you know, the, the whole team, uh, you know, we, we, we have a lot of ideas and we welcome ideas. I think that's a really fantastic idea. Uh, so we are, you know, we're, we're still making things uh, uh, real and tangible as, as we go along, but that's something definitely to consider and we will definitely uh, look to, to put that in place. <clears throat> Next question. This is for everyone. How would you navigate the tension between strengthening and serving the African diaspora and changing the generally negative perceptions of blackness? And in particular, ideas about the African continent in the wider community, um, for example, in Atlanta. That question is from Anja Sabunia. Is this for everyone? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that artists are always at the forefront, not always, but many artists, all of us here are at the forefront of this discussion. And it's really important to, um, to bring this work in some way, shape or form into the schools. Because as a former public school teacher, I know what happens when you're in a classroom with people who are predominantly um, you know, people of African descent, yet the, what they're learning in school has absolutely nothing, it's just, it's actually oppressive when it comes to who we are and what our histories are. And so it's very important to have young people engaging with, not necessarily that they have to be making, but imagine what it means for a young person in a high school class to be writing a paper about 
Bahamu's work? How deep and late, how many things do you have to read in order to understand and to grasp and ask questions about? And I think that that's, that's where we need to be in terms of getting this work outside of just the, um, the museums and the art galleries, but getting it into schools in creative ways and having young people engage in it. Even knowing that here we are existing, all of us in different, from different backgrounds and everything, but having similar conversations and kind of, um, you know, deconstructing things and coming up with new ideas, young people have to be at the forefront of yeah. that as well. And I will mm -hmm. say, you know, from uh, the perspective of Adama as well, one of the things that we're really focused on in terms of our long-term plan is really it's, it's situating um, Adama in a community that has been traditionally underserved uh, by the arts. So, you know, uh, if, if you've ever been to Atlanta, you'll know that the museums and things that we do have here are all kind of centrally located in the same spot. Um, but we want to put Adama in a community that looks like us, you know, so that that little, uh, uh, you know, boy from the SWATs, you know, walks into Adama and sees somebody in Botswana, you know, that looks like him, you know what I'm saying? I, I think that changes the way you see yourself as a Black person. That changes mm -hmm. all of the, the perceptions that you've been fed about yourself as a Black person in this world. And this, you know, extends from my own experiences, experiences traveling around uh, the world and again, going places and seeing myself in places that I've never been before, you know? Like everywhere we go, there we are, literally, you know? It's like you can identify and connect to yourself outside of your community. I, I think that changes anything that anybody can tell you about who you are. Mm -hmm. uh, Anyone else want to tackle that? We have four minutes. I think, I, I think um, for me, yeah, like really what you were talking about, Faham, uh, uh, on that like traveling, I think it's like so important. Uh, mm -hmm. Like the way I see it, I do it like on my humble level is like, I actually like mentor uh, young people and young artists and I try to make like exchange programs where they travel. I have like some some uh, uh, young folks from like my mom's hood, they came to uh, Senegal with me to France and they saw other uh, uh, young artists from the hood and work together. So like, that's something I think like it's really important to 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 engage other people to see how it is in other places and, and other spaces. But also like you know when you don't have these opportunities, I think like what's really important and what uh, um, uh, Adama was saying is that uh, yeah you have to also bring uh, this to the communities. Um, uh, we had like um, um, a conversation with journalists like uh, um, in South Africa. <laughs> and he was arguing that I think like rightfully so that because um, you know like we're there, uh, at um, Cape Town Art Fair and everything that like artists what our work or whatever is like you know uh, revolutionary and, and we talk about a lot of things um, um, yeah, Mali Bongwe Mali Bongwe was the, the, the journalist but uh, even if our message is rev revolutionary like we're actually the places where we we talk about what we talk or not like you know they're like they're a lot of times like they're very like you know white spaces and who we sell the work to also uh uh a lot of times like not necessarily people uh uh who we should talk to or whatever so i think and it's funny because like after that conversation like the next day i went to uh to this gallery uh uh in langa um uh which is uh um, a community in a in a in a Cape Town, where there's like uh, brothers doing like an incredible uh, job, where they open like a, a gallery uh, in the hood, uh, and they show artists that you know like uh, that are established and uh, uh, who actually also like sell work at pretty high uh, price points and, and everything. Um, and I think that's like also revolutionary in in, in a way. And so very important because people from the community just go and engage with the guy. Like a lot of times, like it's it's uh, galleries are so intimidating, and and museums can be. Uh, so I think it's very important to have these spaces in these places. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and like you know, for, for so many reasons, like uh, just like in those kind of spaces, you know, parents will tell you, oh, you can't be an artist because like they 
they uh they think that you can't necessarily like make money with it or whatever you know then you know if you come to a gallery you see like crazy price points like me to to your reality then you, like mentalities might change for instance they'd be like oh maybe you can do art uh rather than be a doctor or something you know mm -hmm. and uh but um yeah i think but besides that i think it's like so important to actually bring art to the communities uh but like on a uh more um how do you say that more sanitary way than just like come in here and there you know what i'm saying i think it's like very important to have uh, uh art in the communities and and uh uh there's people like piazza gates who do, do that like you know awesomely like in the shot like you know shout outs to him and, and other people, you know, like, so I, I think that's like one of the clues, you know. Okay, I think that's about all the time that we have. Um, if any attendees, I'm very sorry we didn't get to your questions. Some of these are really, really good. If you wouldn't mind emailing them to AFRDAMA at Gmail. Thank you all so much for spending this hour and 15 minutes with us. We really appreciate your presence. Thank you to Bisa, Delphine, Thank Fahamu, you. and Lexi. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>